This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turf Talk. Well, we welcome everybody in tonight here at Turf Talk and uh, Coons Ford Turf Talk. It's not been a great week for the University of Maryland which uh, was emphasized today in news that we kind of expected with Kevin Herter going to the uh, deciding to forego his final two years in college to go to uh, the NBA. But we kind of knew that was going to happen. And, of course, the two lacrosse losses and whatever else and the tragic death of Cliff Tucker. Tough times uh, this week at College Park. To discuss everything with me, especially the basketball end of it, it's my good buddy from Rivals.com, and that, of course, is Scott Green. Scott, welcome in. How you doing, Bruce? Pretty tough week, huh, buddy? Yeah, uh, between lacrosse and, like you said, hearing about Cliff Tucker and then Herder today, definitely not the uh, best of weeks for Turf fans. You know, you and me were talking this afternoon, and we were both kind of, like, amazed that Kevin Herder was still up in the air Due to the fact that I've seen in Sports Illustrated, he, they've got him going to the Spurs and Popovich at 17, uh, NBA Draft.net, I think they have him at 21 to Utah, and then last night on US, ESPN, they had him 22 to Chicago. Where's the thought of even coming back? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at it and look at the way he performed the first day of the Combine, I mean, basically he's a six seven shooter. Um, he's got a great basketball IQ, and he's pretty athletic. And when you think about it, the one thing the NBA always needs is shooters, and especially shooters with size. Um, so based on what he did at the Combine, he kind of went from a guy who was a fringe first-rounder to where he was, you know, someone that I think, you know, at least five or six teams like in the first round. And there are a ton of teams looking for shooting guards there between, say, 16 and 26, let's say. Um, And given that, I think there were so many teams that are in need for a shooter that, you know, it just kind of so happens that this year was a great year for him to come out, and a lot of teams need a shooter right now. Yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, evident. They even even talked a little bit about the Lakers wanting him. I mean, they've named four or five teams that want him, and that might not be the team he goes to because he could wind up climbing even higher. When, When is the draft? What's the exact date, the 21st? Uh, yeah, I believe so. And I mean, and when you just look at it, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, some NBA sources I've talked to, I mean, I've heard teams anywhere from Phoenix, Milwaukee, basically everyone 16 through about 21, except maybe Minnesota. So I'd say Phoenix, Milwaukee, San Antonio, Atlanta, Utah, and even Chicago at 22. I've heard all of them, um, you know, connected with Herder at some point. And, you know, and I've got sources on a few of those teams, and I know for a fact that those teams really like them. So, you know, while some people, are, you know, some Maryland fans are going, oh, I'm not even sure he's going to be a first-round pick, um, you know, more and more as we kind of gather more info heading into the draft, I'm kind of, I think I'll be kind of surprised if he actually lasts into the 20s. No, I agree with you. He's definitely going to be a first-round pick. And depending on where he is, he gets slotted definitely over a million dollars, maybe somewhere between a million five, a million seven, depending on how high he goes. Two years guaranteed, one-year option. Does that sound about right? Yeah, and and I'll say this, too. I think that's maybe part of the reason why he maybe struggled with this is because, you know, a lot of people don't know this maybe, but Herter is young for his class. Um, so, you know, he kind of had an extra year that he could have, you know, just stayed in college, had his fun. But, you know, when you're, when you're talking about anywhere from 4 to $6 million guaranteed and then possibly a third-year option with another $2 million on top of that, and the fact that he is younger, you know, it gives him an early start to get, up, get to that second contract where they really make the money. Um, I, I think this was kind of a no-brainer for him. Yeah, it's amazing that uh, – I wonder how Turge took it. I mean, I know that – he definitely wanted him back. There's no doubt about it. But he he's got to be somewhat, somewhat relieved with the way uh, Aaron Wiggins has been playing. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I I certainly think he wanted him back. Even you know, looking beyond just what Herder does on the court, uh, I think he was definitely one of the the main leaders for the team. Definitely one of the more vocal guys on the team. So you know, when you look at it from you know not just what he's production on the court, but the leadership he brought off of it. Uh, I think that will be a big loss. Um, but, yeah, when you look at the freshman guards coming in, 
Um, you know, I was at the Capitol Classic a few weeks back and watched Wiggins. And, you know, I saw him last summer. I saw him once during the winter. And, you know, I really like the men, but uh, I, I think the light bulbs just kind of come on for Wiggins. He's gotten a lot more aggressive, and he was already a terrific three-point shooter. Um, and he's a terrific defender, too, a uh, terrific perimeter defender. So I think just from a, a, a talent standpoint, he has a chance to come in and, you know, kind of really lift Maryland and give them some of that production you know, that they're going to lose from Herter. But you know, I think the biggest loss is just going to be, you know, in the locker room. Yeah, Herter was something special. And it's funny, I was talking with Zach Bolno about it. He's the SID in Maryland. And I said, what do you think? He says, you know, if I wasn't sure that he has the ability, which I am pretty sure of, he says, when they interview that kid, that's going to that's gonna turn the page. And you know that. This is a very well-versed basketball kid. And uh, with the right attitude and, you know, you know he had to do a great sell job without even trying. Yeah, and I mean, you know, like, and you know what I mean. You've been there post game, and you know, to listen to him do interviews. I mean, he's just very calm, very poised. You know, his father played, his brother plays. Um, you know, and you know, his father does television, so I think he's or radio and TV. So I think he's just kind of used to being around it. And I, I think that's another thing that kind of drew NBA teams towards them. But it, it's funny in his comments, you could. Ex- Expressed some of the doubt, or you could see some of the doubt or the remorse he had for leaving Maryland about how much he loved the school and the fans and Coach Turgeon. And let's face it, he liked being the man. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, can't blame him. Um, and, and I think, too, you know, you're not going to hear this. No one's going to say this now, but uh, I think there was probably definitely a little bit of remorse just in the fact that, you know, obviously last year's team did not make the postseason. And I think. You know, he would have liked to go out a winner, making an NCAA tournament, maybe making a bit of a deep run. Um, but obviously that's not going to happen. But if I had to guess, you know, it's probably one regret he does have in not coming back. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's the real mindset that these guys just love school. And they're not in the – a guy like Herter really wasn't in the position where if he came back, how's he going to improve? You know, where is he going to go to? Is he is he ever going to be a top five pick? We doubt that. I mean, so where was his upside in coming back? And I think that that's the bottom line. And there is a downside. If he got hurt, if uh, all of a sudden he went into a, a horrible shooting slump or, you know, you got to go when they want you. And it's that, it's that simple. There's no doubt about it. And, and I don't even think it's just that. But, I mean, I, I think a perfect example of what I'm about to talk about is uh, Dante DiVincenzo, you know, he's a guy who a lot of teams watched early on. They are like, oh, this kid red-shirted. He's not that athletic. And then as the season progressed and they see what he did in the Final Four, suddenly going, wow, what were we thinking? This kid's terrific. We're going to draft him in the first round. And, you know, every year you have maybe two or three guys like that, and maybe you have two or three freshmen that impress. And, you know, when you're in that teens just outside the lottery, I mean, it's like you said, it's going to be really tough to improve your stock. So I think from a personal standpoint, I think he definitely made the right decision. Yeah, uh, for sure. But look, I think that as a Maryland fan, if you look at Bruno Fernando and Kevin Herter and you say, which one did the team really need to come back? You could make a case for Fernando more than her. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, there's going to be much argument that Herder is probably the more talented player of the two. That said, you know, all of a sudden, with all these guards Maryland's bringing in this this upcoming season, you know, I think that softens the blow a little bit, losing Herder. You know, you look at Wiggins, you know, he's very similar to Herder. You know, now you've got Sorrell Smith, who's another shooting guard that can really fill it up, and then, of course, Eric Ayala. Uh, but when you look at the front court, you know, Justin Jackson's gone. Um, you know, Checo's graduated. Um, you know, even Schneider Harrard's not going to be eligible until midway through the season. Uh, so I think losing Fernando would have been a huge blow just because there, there's pretty much no depth after that in the front court. So I think having him, and especially, and he has the ability to keep improving. Um, you know, he's gotten foul trouble last season, and, you know, I, I think he's got the ability to really improve. So I think getting him back, 
just when you look at the dynamics of, you know, everyone else coming in, I think him coming back might have been a little bit more important. Explain to me about why it would have been a mistake for uh, Fernando to leave. And you don't have to use any names or whatever, what you told me, but you, you gave a very good reasoning about what he might have been promised and how that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, with a guy like him, teams really like what they see and, you know, like the potential. So, you know, they possibly like them mid-second round, late-second round. But, you know, they'll tell teams, hey, we like you, you know, or maybe one or two other guys. And, you know, kids hear that, you know, um, the people advising them hear that, and they get excited and want to stay. But the reality is, you know, when they like you or one or two other guys, the truth is they probably don't like you that much at all. So, you know, for someone like him, I think he's got the measurables and, you know, he's got that motor, that intangible that people like as far as, you know, playing the court. But now, you know, he's just kind of kind of has to take his game to the next level this upcoming season, um, stay out of foul trouble, um, you know, really defend well and, you know, keep improving that offensive game. And, you know, a lot of people think next year, if he improves at the, at the same clip he did this year, he could be a lottery pick next year himself. Yeah, it certainly could happen. And in fact, you know, those are the we'll want to lose him next year because if we do, it means that he's had a hell of a year. And uh, Maryland needs a hell of a year real bad, and so does Coach Turgeon. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'll tell everybody out there, Scott Green from Rivals, who's on the phone right now, has tremendous contacts within the NBA and people who call him for opinions, and he, he has an open phone access to all of them. So he gave me some sources on... Uh, on Fernando that, you know, it would be best for him to come back. And I think that uh, he heeded the advice. And, you know, that's a good thing about the combines. You don't have to sign with an agent. And he was able to come back. And I think it's it was a bit of a, a surprise how much that Herder really took over, like, the combine and how he might have been the most – he might have elevated himself the most over anybody else in that combine. Yeah, I mean, when when you go down the, go down the list, I mean, maybe someone like a Zaire Smith out of Texas Tech, um, uh, but maybe a Chandler Hutchison. But I mean, honestly, I, I want to say outside of Zaire Smith at Texas Tech, I'm not sure anyone helps themselves more at the combine than Herder. And I think I think it's because, like I said, teams just saw him as only a shooter when they really got to sit down and talk to him. Uh, you know, see his athleticism and the shuttle runs and things like that, and all of a sudden they're going, well, we know his floor is maybe, say, someone like, uh, uh, I don't even know, um, who's the, oh, I'm trying to think, who's the three-point specialist for the Cavs right now? Um, Kyle Korver? Korver. Yeah. You know, let's say his floor is someone like Kyle Korver, but, you know, if suddenly he's showing that he's faster than people think, can jump higher than people think, you know, when your floor is someone like Kyle Korver, all of a sudden, you, you know, your, your NBA stock's going to rise and rise and rise. And I think that's kind of what happened. When you can shoot like Herter, he sure exhibited that last year. He might have had a couple bad games, but uh, he exhibited his three-point ability in his two years there. And that was not on a great team or not on a team that had a bunch of, like, uh, easy scores. You know, the potential was there. And uh, bye-bye, Kevin. We wish him best of luck. You know, most of these kids go to college to to further their career when they're on that level. You don't know what happens, which is why education is the backup. It's not the it's not the forward step. It's the backup for these really good college players. But uh, that's it for him. It's time to move on. And I think that uh, Turgeon's got enough guns to make to make it certainly make the NCAA and maybe a, make a little bit of a run. I mean, I, I'm pretty positive about it. And, and, I, and I will add this. I mean, when you look at, you know, someone like Herter, you know, right now Maryland has two guys in the league, uh, Lehman, who, you know, is pretty, I mean, honestly, pretty much doesn't play a whole lot. And then Alex Len, who's kind of struggled. Um, you know, the one guy Turgeon has in the league that, you know, it's been pretty productive is Chris Middleton in, in Milwaukee. But the one thing i got to stress, though, is, you know, if Herter can become a successful NBA player, you know, that's what sells the McDonald's All-Americans on a program. You know, they want to see the winning, but even more importantly, they want to know that you can get them to that next level. So I think if he can become a great NBA player and gets drafted highly, I think it's great for the program, you know, looking ahead into the future.
Tell me what you know about the passing away of Cliff Tucker. Very, very tragic. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and uh, you saw how how upset and everybody was, but especially Gary Williams. He loved the kid. Uh, when did you and what did you have you heard any further more about it? No, I mean I got I got a text from a buddy um, like early on in the day, and I guess apparently they were in a, a van. I, I want to say, tra- I guess he was traveling to a basketball tournament or maybe a uh, some sort of camp or something. I guess uh, there was a single van accident. Uh, Cliff was, one, I think, one of six passengers. Unfortunately, you know how it is in some of those types of vans. No one was wearing their seatbelt. Um, so all the guys were thrown from the vehicle. Um, fortunately, a few passed away. Um, you know, just sad. He was 29 years old. And uh, played professionally overseas for a while. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but he's probably considered El Paso's probably greatest high school athlete ever. Uh, was a great basketball and football player. Uh, even played spring ball here at Maryland uh, his final year. Um, but, yeah, just tragic. I mean, you know, 29 years old, way too young. And uh, like I said, you know, Maryland, Maryland fans will always have that Georgia Tech buzzer beater to remember him by. And like you said, loved what um, – you know, Gary Williams said, you know, basically ending with he's he'll always be one of us. You know, he'll always be a Maryland grad. So it's a, words can't describe the uh, sadness of that to die in a you know a, a van accident, any kind of car accident. But it was a shocker, I have to tell you. And I think it came right at the end of. Uh, I heard. I mean, I knew Maryland. Maryland, the woman lost and the men lost, and then Fernando said he was staying, and then uh, then. So I was a little bit better mood, and then I heard that uh, that Tucker was gone, and that was it. That was like you know this this just got this weekend's got to come to an end, all right. But uh, it's it's a shame for uh, for the university, for his family, and he was a good kid, and he was a clutch shooter. It's one thing he was was a clutch shooter, not just that one shot, and that shot was insane. All right. That was a big shot for Maryland's run that year, too. Absolutely. I mean, that, that was a great team. Yeah. And uh, if I'm, I'm, is that is that the same game when Keith Booth called the timeout by mistake and Gravis hit the shot? And then the next play was Cliff Tucker hitting that uh, bomb, yep. f- bomb from, like, not even the corner. It was a Stephon Curry-type shot. Yep. But uh, Cliff is gone, so uh, it's how it goes. Listen, Scott, as always, we thank you. Real quick, take a stab at a starting lineup. It's awful early, but take a stab at a starting lineup for the Terps. I think I'm probably going to surprise you a little bit here, but I okay. think I'm going to go with uh, Anthony Cowan at the point. Um, I'm going to say Eric Ayala at the two, Aaron Wiggins at the three, uh, Sticks at the four, and Bruno at the five. Sounds, with, sounds with, good with to me. With Daryl Morcell as your first guy off the bench. Right. Daryl Morcell will certainly be in the mix no matter what. And I wouldn't be surprised early on if he starts until he, uh, somebody else plays their way in or he plays his way out. But uh, you you got a good eight-man rotation when you throw in a couple of the other guys. And uh, and, and Bender, is he going? Is that, is that ship sailed? I, be, I haven't heard that he's gone anywhere, but at the same time, I'm not sure that he's going to be healthy enough to play either. Just kind of playing it by ear on that one. Okay. I'm not, not quite certain on that, on that one yet. Scott Green, Rivals.com. You can uh, – great, great Maryland stuff that Scott always has. He's on top of everything. And as always, I thank you for coming in, Scott. All right. Thanks, Bruce. All right. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk here on Wednesday night, every Wednesday night for the past 11 years. And we'll be back in a few minutes with Bill, the producer at the helm, and our new intern, Jake, from Bloomsburg College in Pennsylvania, right in York County. And he's breaking into the business, so we wish him the best of luck. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back on the phone, back on the line here, I should say. This is Bruce Posner, uh, segment two. And, of course, we always bring in my good buddy, Dennis Kalatis. Dennis, welcome in this evening. 
Bruce, thanks for having me on as always. Well, I have to ask you a question because I was a little surprised today that uh, yesterday that Tom Wilson did not receive a suspension for that cheap hit that he laid on uh, one of the Golden Knights the other night. How did you feel about that? Well, you know, it, it, it was a bit late, but I think what helped him was that the uh, the player that he did hit, his name escaped my mind right now, but uh, he was able to bounce back. He didn't miss any time. So I think that went in his defense. Uh, he's got the reputation. He's earned it. But it's good news for the Capitals. Look, they played well the other night. Uh, they had chances. They have some film now on the Golden Knights, and hopefully they'll be able to, to come out of there with, uh, with spitting up the, uh, the first two games. Uh, I sure hope so, but I think the, I think they're in trouble. I think tonight can be the whole series, not the whole series. You got to win four times. Oh. But for the Caps to go down o two, and they're not the greatest team at home, they really are. Uh, you know, they're they're not. But you know what? I was I was encouraged that they were able to put up four goals against Mark Andre Fleury. The one thing, Bruce, too, that ice up there, it's really sloppy. It's really soft. Uh, they they can't get it to to uh, freeze properly. So that's been a factor. I was surprised by the the nine goal output. I know it was ten with that empty netter, but I was really surprised with the high, a high output of goals by both teams. Well, I heard something today on the radio that they were talking about how the boards were like springboards, and the Golden Knights know how to use that to their advantage. Yeah. And Holtby might have had a little trouble with that as the puck was coming out, but they use those boards to make passes, and uh, it's a little tricky. And I think the Caps will catch up to that a little bit. And also, they face guarded Ovechkin. So yeah, Ove- Ovechkin's going to – they got some kind of play where so you, it, it will cause Kuz, Kuznetsov to, like, break open. And uh, I'm interested to see that tonight. But, you know, what the heck, Golden, the, the Golden Knights are favored again. i tell you one thing, that introduction thing is so stupid, it's beyond belief. I mean, I, I think it's worth the price of admission, Bruce, when you have uh, Little John and uh, you know, Chris Angel and you have Michael Buffer – uh, you know, that's that's uh, real star power, serious star power right there. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. That is all quiet on the Ravens' front, it seems. What's going on? I don't hear much going on. No, not a whole lot. You know, they have the OTAs. It was nice to see Joe Flacco uh, immediately develop chemistry with Michael Crabtree. He's going to definitely need to see him. Crabtree will be a big red zone target as well. Jaleel Scott's a six foot five rookie out of New Mexico State. He's a six foot five, two hundred twenty pound wide receiver. He flashed during the OTAs again. They're not in full pads, Bruce, so it's hard to tell. And also the other rookie out of UCLA, uh, Jordan Lashley, uh, good hands, good speed, got, got a bit of a twist to him. Uh, you know, again, but they're, you know, can't get excited until they put pads on. No, it's certainly the case. But uh, what, once the basketball ends in a couple of weeks, then it's like a oh, full speed hit around here on the Ravens because the Orioles just, it's just not worth talking about right now. It's just nothing but bad news. And, uh, you know, the Ravens will soon uh, take over the airwaves. NBA championship, Cleveland's been established as a 10-1 to underdog against wow, Golden that's, State. that's huge, Bruce. You've you got you to spend $1,000 to win 10, right? 100. That's, 100, uh, right. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. And that's the, the heavy odds, and nobody's giving them a chance. The first game, 12.5-point favorites is Golden State. Well, I think they're going to blow them out at home to send a message the first game, and uh, I think they're going to. I think Cleveland will go home 0 and 2 as they usually do when they're on the road, and hopefully they can take a couple of Cleveland and keep this thing interesting. I think. But look, I think LeBron James has done nothing but cement his legacy. The guy has been out, lights out, and uh, I think he's a top one of the top five players of all time. He'd be my starting five for sure. He'd be my starting one. He'd be my first pick. I'd take him over anybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I had an argument with somebody at work, and then they they said, "Look, he's in my top five, but not in my top three. And my, my rebuttal was, how can, how can he not be in your top three? The guy plays four positions, and he plays them all great. Well, look, to me, LeBron's in my top three, and and, Le, and uh, um, MJ's in my top three. And Will Chamberlain, it's a hard case to throw him off the pedestal with his numbers when you analyze it. But LeBron does something else. He will, you know, it's nine straight championship games, championship That's series insane. he'll be in. That's, that's insane. It, that's, it's beyond insane. And this team was so bad, it's a joke. Yeah. This team it's beyond, it's beyond comprehension. And, and to go up to, uh, to Boston uh, without Kevin Love and, and to be able to, you know, they were only down by four and a half. My like, guys, you know, Boston's in trouble. You can tell they were in trouble. And, uh, look, he played every minute of game seven. 
at age 33, Bruce, I don't recall Michael Jordan being that good at 33. I think at 32, Michael started noticeably re- regressing. I can't remember the years, but Michael Jordan yeah. went six, won six uh, national championships, which puts him in another category, except that LeBron does it all. He rebounds. It's a, you know what? It's a silly argument because it, is. It, it, it just is. But, I mean, I've never seen by the, the way they won that game. And that one layup he made when the guy literally was on his shoulders yeah. was almost beyond conception. So no, he, would have been, he would have been a Hall of Fame tight end had he played football and he remained injury-free. He's just a phenomenal athlete and well, an all-around good guy. He's a family man. You don't see him getting in trouble. You know, he's married, got kids. Uh, he contributes to... Uh, to, to the communities uh, all over the country, social causes. He's, he's, he's a good guy. and I don't know why there's so much hate against him. Did you know that Joe Flacco was the 31st radio quarterback last year? Yes. That's not... But, you know, but, but I also go back to the stats are for losers, depending on what you're looking for. I mean, you know, the other thing is he probably had the 32nd worst uh, receiving core. <laughs> Who was he throwing to? He might have had... People. He, had, he might have been worse than 32nd. All right? but <laughs> You might throw in Alabama in there. Right? Uh, you remember the Vikings game when they had Griff Whalen out there and Michael Campanero? I mean, they had nobody out there to put him to throw the ball to. It was ridiculous. Yeah, for sure. But uh, we might go even a little bit deeper than 32 that last year. Some good college teams. Yeah, they're, they're great. Alabama, yeah, that, they had a better receiving court. Calvin Ridley was certainly one of the stars there. But look, looking forward to the, to the football season and uh, Lamar Jackson has certainly brought some, uh, some spark to camp, and it's going to be interesting to see this young man develop. All right, speaking of developing, what's going on at Coons? I know you're 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 you in the closeout mode now for 2018s. Oh, we're, yeah, we just had our big uh, uh, Memorial Day sale over the weekend, Bruce, and we're closing at the month. Everybody's open to close today and tomorrow. Uh, still giving up zero percent for 72 months, which makes a big big difference in payment. When you're talking about fifty and sixty and seventy thousand dollar automobiles. Uh, Ford is supporting us with some great, great incentives, and you know we have 600 plus brand new vehicles in stock and over 200 pre-owned. So we're business is good, Bruce. Used cars are awful strong now, aren't they, Dennis? Yeah, awful strong. Well, the used car market is always great, Bruce. 36 to 40 million used vehicles are sold every year in America, no matter what the mar- no matter what the economy is, no matter what the market is. That's a that's a very, very strong uh, business model there. What's new for Ford in 19? Anything special? Uh, they're coming out with uh, with uh, the Ranger. That's making a comeback. The the big Bronco is also making a comeback. Uh, the Bullet, the Mustang Bullet, the Steve McQueen car. That's coming out as well. We have six coming in. Uh, a lot of things on the drawing board. Very exciting times here at, at at Ford. Yeah, that's for sure. Dennis, again, we'll be on your show tomorrow at four thirty. Uh, up the dial on the Sunday Sports Voice and tell everybody how they can get a hold of you, partner. Be- best place is my cell phone. The rings I'm going to hit four ten. Two one eight zero three three seven. Websites Coons Ford, uh, Coons Baltimore Ford dot com or Coons Ford Baltimore dot com. And again, I'm always here at the office four ten two one eight zero three three seven. Love taking care of uh, Turf Talk uh, listeners for sure. And uh, see my buddy Peter Deluda. He's still hanging around, right? Pete's doing a great job. He's, he's growing uh, just fine as, as everybody else is. We're uh, we know we're, our motto is grow or go, so we're <laughs> have to be in a continuous growing mode for sure. Dennis, thanks a lot for coming on. We'll talk to you tomorrow. My pleasure, Bruce. Be well. Go Ravens and go Terps. All right. You know, a lot of talk today. I was listening across the uh, 105.7 dial to what to do about Chris Davis. And, I mean, the move to, of him to clean up was beyond belief. It really was. Now, he's back in the six hole tonight. Uh, you can make a case. Why is he in the lineup? How much of a detriment is he batting 152 or 153? And... Four homers, four RBI, 14 RBIs. So those numbers are almost insane. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Kenny Wyman made a good point. There's a lot of National League pitchers batting better than that. I mean, this is, you know, where does it end with uh, Chris Davis? I uh, sure hope it gets better, but it just seems to be getting worse. And he's pressing and pressing and pressing. And it's, it's not working. It's not working. And. Uh, pretty soon the fans, the ones that come to the game, will start leaning on him a little bit. So far they've been pretty good. But uh, the Yankees are coming to town this weekend. I'm sure they'll have some great crowds for that. They had a great crowd on Monday, even though they lost. And if we can avoid the rain, we'll have a decent one today. I'll be there tonight. Uh, Stop by and see me. I'll be at the Admins booth for a while. And uh, serving up the best food that's at Camden Yards, I'll tell you that. 
All right, back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300, and we will review the lacrosse weekend from Wayne Viner, who was there with Mason, and it was not a happy weekend for the University of Maryland. Back in a few minutes. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment three of Coons Ford Term Talk. And, uh, wow, it was a tough weekend. I had a wedding on Saturday, so the plans were for me to uh, come up there Monday for the championship game. But those plans never happened, did they, Wade Viner? They did not, and I am substituting the Maryland NCAA tournament final for being downtown D.C. tonight for the Stanley Cup watch party. So you're, I'm going to get happy one way or the other. You're you're like in the watch party big time now after the other night. Oh, it was oh, it was great. We didn't get to talk about it on the air, but the last watch party was fantastic. It's one of the best games I've never been to. <laughs> it's surely better than paying a grand for a ticket. That's for sure. Yeah, a little bit of parking, a little bit of food, and the rest of it's free. Uh, yeah, about $1,000 for a ticket for Saturday night. That's a lot. And that's not even a good seat. Yeah, that's in the boonies up there, the boondocks. So, uh, you know, we shall see. Wayne, tell us about the weekend in uh, in Foxborough. I understand they know us well by now, don't they? Oh, they do know us fairly well. Of course, the Maryland team knows us, and we were – in the tunnel, just like we were last year with the team before they came out, and some of those pictures and video, it's all up on TerpTalk.com. Uh, my takeaway from being really close to the team, especially at the championship level, is last year's group had a lot more fire to them. And I think you were in the tunnel when we were in Annapolis against Cornell, and you saw that it was Corley or Dan Morris. But it wasn't all 30 or 40 guys at that hype level. So it was a little different makeup. There are a lot of freshmen that played a lot of minutes, Bruce. Yeah, well, and Tell- their, their first time out. Tillman mentioned that the alpha male situation was reduced. All right, there were so many on the team last year, they were hard to count. But let's take a minute or two, Wayne, and first of all, to say disappointed. I think you'll agree with this statement. You and me were devastated. We were not. This was not the kind of team like it was last year. And tremendous credit to Coach Tillman for getting this team to the Final Four. That's seven and eight years. And I, for one, will never be upset over that. And I'm sure you won't either. To do what he's done has been nothing short of a miracle. To play that many minutes, on, especially on the attack side and on the defensive midi side, with guys that really didn't play before, in some cases, Wisnowskis played almost every minute. Bubba Fairman, a, a true freshman, played almost every minute. The short sticks on defense were all new, and this team has been number one almost all year. That's one hell of a job, Bruce. I mean, they, these minutes last year were all fourth and fifth year seniors. This year, for those players, they're all freshmen. Well, the funny thing about it is if you would have said that uh, this last year we lost Maltz and Rambo and Heacock and Timmy Muller, uh, if you would have said, well, wait a minute, those weren't the guys that were really missed. The guys that were really missed were IDA, Isaiah Davis Allen, and Nick Manis, the short stick defenders, Wayne, that when all was really? said and done, those were the guys – that they were really taken advantage of as the as the freshmen were, and no fault of the freshmen, they were freshmen, and they had you know they had four seniors going up against them, and I think that's finally where Maryland got exposed a little bit, but it'll be good to have all those guys with a lot more experience next year, and a new wave of troops coming in. Let's go down to senior list. I'll let you comment on. We'll alternate comment. Well, well- but before you do that, you yeah. said you can't be that disappointed. And there is a definite difference being here in D.C. tonight looking back at the weekend than being on the field where you can feel the game. And it was 8-7, to seven, and I would have bet the house that we were winning that game. So if you look at our pregame show and go, hey, you guys made it to the Final Four, why do you look so sad? It's because I think we were that close. We were one play away, Bruce. That's how I really feel about it. So, 
All right, now we can move on. All right, well, first of all, I'll start with Connor Kelly. Just a tremendous career at Maryland. Finished with 191 points. Above, above all else, I mean, he was the leader of the team this year. And let's not underestimate how well he achieved at that task. Uh, with the whole 17 attack on, he led the entire uh Led the offense to a super season. He helped ensure the future by taking Bubba and Logan. Logan was now since under his wing. A wonderful young man. And my thanks to him for a great four years at Maryland as he will be at the Tawarton Award tomorrow that Todd Carton will cover for us. I'll let you go with uh, Tim Rotance, uh, Wayne. Timmy Rotance is a kid who's been here for a long time. He had an injury and some vertigo, so he missed a year. Uh, but when it came down to a guy you want to have the ball who need to make the big play on the Maryland offense, he became your the midi you could count on to score and played that role a lot during this year. He also played some defensive midi because he had to. He is a true terrapin, a true leader of this team, and he will be missed. Yeah, yeah, he provided many key key goals down the stretch of the games. I'll go to Bryce Young. Number 41 was a long pole leader of the defense, and combined with Curtis Corley, who will take that role next year, and he will be great at that role. I think you agree with me. He intimidated the opponents, a great ground ball player. Bryce always seemed to be at the right place at the right time. He'll move on to the MLL. Great player. I'm going to give you the honor of describing Danny Morris and his two wonderful years in the cage for the Terps. Well, I'm probably going to have Mason jump in and put in a word for him as well. But for right now, look, you said it. Dan Morris is the only goalie in forever for Maryland that won the NCAA tournament. Here's a kid who came out of Dallas Jesuit. He sat on the bench for a while. He's a fifth-year senior. He made some big saves and big games, and he became the bedrock of the defense. Mason, you have anything to add to that? You said most of it. His name, his claim to fame will be the national championship. But other than that, I kind of felt like he led the team and really made big things happen for the guys the past two years, and he gave it his all. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, well, you know what else, Mason? I mean, let's face it, without Timmy Rotance, I mean, without Danny Morris in that uh, semifinal game, I think the Terps might have lost by by 10 goals. I mean, he was that good, especially early well, Bruce, on. What do you have to compare about that? Burn Lore, Nico Amato, Dan Morris, they all would have been in that game. There's not much that at least I've seen in my short lacrosse life at goalie for Maryland that wouldn't have done what was done by Danny Morris. Yeah, the, and of course he was tutored by those guys as he tutored this new kid Morris and Bosch, who could be the goalie next year, and uh, we'll see what happens, but that goalie status at Maryland is something special. And uh, finally, I'll talk about the other guys. Adam DeMillo came up big in the championship game last year. Again, a guy who played both ways this year because he had to. Michael Adler finally got a goal toward the end of his uh, career. Uh, a big goal against uh, in the semifinal, in the quarter quarterfinal game. Colin Giblin, a guy who played some attack this year, got some goals against Hopkins, played very, very well at the end. And from what I hear now, and also Will Bonaparte, who was a key factor in the championship run last year when uh, they kind of used three or four guys at the faceoff. And Matt Newfelt, I don't know how, but they say he's got another year of eligibility left, that he might be back. It seems like he's been there for five years already. But, uh, yes, it does, Bruce. <laughs> I mean, all in all, it was a great year, and uh, you just—they uh, were beaten on Saturday by the Blue Devils, and that particular day, they were better than Maryland. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it, and Yale was better in both, and uh, a good championship game that I swore I wasn't going to watch, but then I wanted to watch it. But very impressed with Yale, and I think we could easily give the. Tour time award to Ben Reeves. I don't see how he can't win it. Bruce, yes, you got it. You got to admit it right now. I called it. Ben Reeves. Ben Reeves is going to take it. Yeah, well, you did call it, but uh, had Connor come through, it would have been him. But uh, it wasn't, and Ben Reeves deserves it. He played. It was his, it's his third time in it. I think that worked at his favor also. But Yale won the title, and he was the key reason. 
even though what was it Godet or Godet won the MVP, it was still uh, it was still Ben Reeves and. Uh, you know, it would be nice, I think, on June 21st or 22nd, I'm not sure of the day, when Connor Kelly comes back. And, of course, the Charlotte Hounds will be in. So we got a couple good MLL games to go to to pay tribute to the Terps, who uh, got to love these guys. They gave us so much fun over the past four years that it's hard to describe. And uh, that's how I feel about it. And uh, toss in a little Rambo, a little Heacock, and... <clears throat> the guys from last year, it's been a great run. And so, uh, Mason, bring home a victory for the Caps tonight. They need it desperately, desperately. Yes, yes, they do. And, you know, I'm looking forward more to the experience, really, than the game. It's supposed to be great. Haven't gotten out to it yet, so I'm excited for tonight. No, you missed it the other night. But uh, with that, we'll say goodbye to you guys, say goodbye to your dad, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, partner? All right. All right. Take care. All right. So they're down at the Cap Center at the Cap Center and the now it's called Capital One Arena. No longer the Verizon Center. You look into next year and uh, for the Terps men's lacrosse. And I got to talk about the women a few for a few minutes. I should have had Todd on the phone. But uh, what the heck? I mean, the women got to the, the final four two, lost. To Boston College, fifteen to thirteen, and of course Boston College then was beaten by James Madison. So you had BC against James Madison. It's the first time in I think since two thousand four that either Maryland, Northwestern, or Carolina was in that championship game. And of course Maryland and Carolina went down. Carolina took Northwestern down. But uh, great career for Megan Whittle. Nothing to say, and and the the women are in. Good stead for next year, obviously, with Kathy Reese <clears throat> and uh, this new kid coming in from McDonough. Uh, they'll be fine. Now, next year for the men, the, I mean, the attack is pretty much set. Jared Bernhardt and Logan Wisnowskis and probably Bubba Fairman, <clears throat> unless they play with that a little bit and keep Bubba on midfield. The goalie thing will be up for battle. We know that Jack Welding and Doug. Uh, uh, Curtis Corley will lead the defense, and uh, the, some of the guys who blossomed to, toward the end of the year, of course, Will Snyder and uh, Thomas O'Connell, Anthony DeMaio, DeMaio, and we still have Austin uh, Henningsen for two years, and Justin Shockey will be back, uh, you know, Wesley Janik will be back, uh, hopefully Nick uh, Brzezowski will be better for next year, Louis Dubik might do an extra year. Uh, Roman Poglacy, Drew Harrison, this team is set fine. They'll be fine next year. Interesting to see who will get number one. If I had to take a stab at it, it's got to go to Jared Bernhardt. I don't know that you can give it to a defensive guy like Curtis Corley. I think it'll be Jared Bernhardt made for the next few years, and then maybe uh, uh, Bubba Fairman takes over the reign. But uh, Duke was too strong that day. Justin Guterding had three goals and three assists. Uh, Nikkei Montgomery early on beat the shorties, got three goals to put Duke into a great position. But if you thought the Terps were going to quit, you don't know the Terps. Down six to nothing, and then uh, and then eventually eight to two or eight to three, and sure enough, they come back, make it eight to seven, midway through the third quarter with a shot to win. But it wasn't their day. Great, great attendance up in Foxborough. Thirty thousand Saturday, thirty thousand on Sunday. I think that Yale filled up those coffers for that day. They filled up those seats. Uh, they came in by the bus load from uh, from Connecticut. And uh, hats off to Yale. Andy Shea, tremendous, tremendous coach. He's done a great job. And if you've listened to me over the year, more than any other team in the past few years, it was. It was Yale that gave Maryland all the headaches that it could take, without question. It was Yale that beat Maryland twice in a row on the road, and Maryland edged them out by one goal twice at College Park. And let's hope that the let's hope that the uh, series goes back, comes back, because now we have the two former national championships. I'm sure Tillman's going to want to get them on board for the next few years. At least I think he would. And. Uh, Hoops coming up, 
I'm going to make my prediction right now, and that is, of course, Golden State Warriors. I don't think it'll be a sweep. I think it'll be six games. I think uh, Cleveland might win one or two games at home, and I won't sell them short. If Kevin Love doesn't play at all, uh, it could be a sweep. And Iguodala looks like he's out. So everybody's already writing this thing off. I don't think it's a write-off. I think it'll be a uh, series, a good series. And, uh, you know, it's just disappointing. I want to see Houston and Boston. I want to see some different teams, you know. Uh, I'm tired of uh, Durant and the shimmy and uh, from Curry. And it's time to move on as it's time to move on for me as well for tonight. This is Bruce Posner. You uh, tune us back in on Saturday for Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. Uh, we'll be looking at the Orioles. We'll be looking more at Maryland basketball as it starts to become a food of thought now that we know Kevin Herter's not going to be back. And we'll have many more things to talk about, certainly the first game in the NBA series. And that will do us for us tonight. This is Bruce Posner signing off. See you on Saturday morning.